Hi, I'm Roshana Baldwin, a journalist, a Chicagoan, and a millennial bringing light to everyday stories that matter. I share the type of stories that mainstream media ignores or gets wrong. The news of the neighborhoods, the news that matters. Here is someone you need to know. Meet Kanisha Baynard. Welcome, Kanisha Baynard. You're an you're author, productivity strategist, and creative coach from the South Bay area. How are you? I'm well. Hello, everyone. Rashawn, I'm so great to see you. So happy. I'm so happy to see you, and I'm so happy to talk to you about all the great work you're doing and how it's even more important now with COVID-19. How are you all, first and foremost, how are you doing? How is... San Francisco doing? How are you all handling the shelter in place in COVID-19? Yeah, thanks for asking about that. It's just been a very interesting 2020, as you know. And so we do live in the Bay Area, so that's Northern California for people who are not familiar. And we are um, about 40 miles outside of San Francisco, and we live in Santa Clara County, which is in the north, um, northern part of California, I've been very hard hit. You know, it's a very large county. So we've had large numbers. Um, we have an amazing um, black female ma- mayor of San Francisco, um, London Breed, and she in late February had um, issued a state of emerging emergency for San Francisco and San Francisco County, which always dictates what we do down in Santa Clara. So I'm very grateful for her early leadership in kind of getting things set in place even before our, the California governor had done shelter in place and information like that um mayor london breed was all on top of that so i feel encouraged in that way one thing i know as a midwestern person in california people take um, rules and guidelines as suggestions so it's been really interesting to observe how people shelter in place but as far as my own immediate family my husband and our two kids we are doing great we're thriving we're having space for creativity and not as many distractions. So it's kind of been um, a nice forced shutdown. And I know that's not the case for everybody because, you know, people are grappling with keeping their jobs and, you know, different things like that. And so we're very much um, thinking about that and just working to support people in that in that way as much as we can in our local area. That's good. I'm glad that you all are good and safe. I always start most of my interviews off with how is everyone doing and how you all been handling um, the pivot in COVID-19. I want to know how, as your as as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, um, creativity coach, I like that. How are you helping your clients now to be more productive and use this time that we have at home to be to use it beneficially and use it wisely and not stay at home and Netflix and chill? Well, it's, it's so interesting you ask that question and about the pivoting. So one thing just to back up, you know, I already work from home. So having to work from home wasn't the um, transition for me. My transition was having everybody else at home. And so disrupting how I was in the home you know, day after day by myself and how that worked. And so I think specifically for myself is really negotiating the space, negotiating the the kind of rituals that I had set for myself, working for myself at home as entrepreneurs. So I had to adjust in that way. And then also speaking of how I helped my clients, I really had to help my family readjust to the disappointment that we were all feeling about plans that we couldn't do and then what that looked like when we really didn't know how long things were going to last. I mean, we're still in it. And a lot of people were thinking, you know, by April, you know, we were going to have a whole different situation. Not so much. And so I think one of the things I had to do for myself as an entrepreneur was just reassess my priorities since everything shifted beyond my control so quickly, like on a dime, I had all these um, in phase or face-to-face travel plans for keynote presentations, you know, big conferences and things like that. And for my work, when I connect with people on that level, that garners people working in my workshops later or I'm um, hiring me as a one-on-one coach or other speaking gigs. So I just wasn't sure how that was going to work for me. And the pivot was a lot of people were figuring out how things were going to work for them. <clears throat> Excuse me. So 
as a productivity coach, I had more people coming to me and my coaching roster was a lot more full than I anticipated because people had to figure out how to all of a sudden work from home, maintain their families, manage boundaries, figure out how to deal with the emotional labor that comes with everything that goes. And that's typically something that falls upon women because they're typically the lead parent in a relationship. And even in, you know, um, same sex marriages or same gender marriages, one of the one of the per people in the home is the lead parent or the lead something. And so the emotional labor increases as we were trying to figure out this newer way of being. And I don't call it the new normal. This is just not normal. It's a new way of being until we can get back to something that's kind of normal because what we were doing before is never going to go back again. So that will be the new normal when we come out of it. But right now, we're still all very much in the transitions, transition um, space. But I think the biggest thing for the clients and for myself was to understand that don't try to make this feel normal. Take it one week at a time, figure out productivity strategies for that week, and then reassess as you go because it, it was just too unstable, right? And as soon as you try to get something in place and it shifts again, that's frustrating for people. And you're already mentally exhausted. You're already, already trying to figure it out. All of us across this particular country had all this different information coming to us. So you're trying to make sense of that. You don't know sometimes your job security or if they're gonna allow it to work this way. So one week at a time is what we really worked on in putting systems and rituals in place to take care of yourself while you're working, while you're living your life, while you're caretaking. Can you give an example of that? What does that look like in terms of your business and how you teach your clients and coach them and putting strategies in place who are now at home? Because okay. am I correct? Is it correct in saying you are considered a life coach? Yeah, I would definitely say I'm a, a life coach. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of people have like this weird... Thing about life coaches you know flaky you know kind of like weird and stuff like that and that's fine some people are life coaches like that and you know let people have their space but i started my career as an educator i started as a high school teacher and went on to work as a university professor and our move to california in at the end of 2012 prompted me to go out on my own and do more of the life coaching piece but i still focused on the areas that i loved when i was actually teaching in a formal setting and i am very much um, dedicated to ages 12 and up. So, you know, teens, young adults and things like that and, and women specifically. And so when we're talking about doing things, you know, week to week, um, I work with a lot of other educators, you know, professors, K-12 teachers and things like that as clients, as an example. And so all of a sudden, you know, they love being with their students. They love being in the classroom. You know, all of a sudden they're at work one day and then next week is automatic remote learning, right? They don't really get to say proper goodbye. They don't have proper time to prepare. It was all a knee-jerk reaction. And on top of that, they're still trying to take care of themselves and their families. So some of the things we talked about, about going one week at a time, do your lesson plans as you normally would, but just for one week. Usually teachers are planning entire units. They're planning entire quarters. They're planning in, you know, entire semesters. No more. Whatever you had planned you know, in March at that time that you were doing, Take the parts that you know right now that are going to fit your energy, that are going to support your students, and that will fit online. The rest of it is not a waste. It's just a not right now. Because a lot of times you've already done the planning, right. and you don't want to waste that planning. You don't want to feel like you wasted that time. And a lot of people were grappling with that type of loss. Like, I've already given the energy, the time, the expertise in getting this together, and now it's all wash. I said, no, no, it's just on the shelf just put it on the shelf you know your electronic shelf your actual shelf take the pieces that work for now this week and let's keep going and then the other piece was you know figuring out how to do these rituals and i use the word rituals because i like to help people create these systems that are focused on energy creativity motivation of course productivity but different things that you need as things shift so a lot of times we were focused on energy rituals, like maybe you did it at the beginning of your day to give you energy, or you notice a lull at 1 p.m.-ish, so mm -hmm. you would do the energy ritual then, or maybe it's right before you have to um, work with your entire family and you're out of that role. And so we worked on what that ritual would look like, 
And we also worked on your start time to work, your end time to work. Because when you're working at home, there's no true definite time of when the work starts and the work ends. That affects your energy, that affects your productivity. And I said, we have to get these things in place for this time right now. And I was like, you know, you have to put on work clothes when it's work time. And when those work hours are off, take those clothes off. Wait a minute. <laughs> now, I, I roasted, and that's so old school, I was joking and giving a friend so much crap about getting dressed, meaning not sweatpants and a suit, but an entire, like a, almost like a suit, but casual. So you're suggesting, and that was your advice to your clients, is to get dressed for work even though you're at home. Well, and, and getting dressed can mean a variety of things. You know, if you're just like Zooming or Google Classrooms, you know, and you all you see this, if you have those sweatpants on the bottom, I don't care about that, but all this needs to be ready for work, right? Get dressed from the waist up. You need to get dressed. You need to have something that signals. One client, we were talking about it, and we were, and, I was, and she is not a teacher. She does, you know, another type of work, but, you know, she had to move. And I said, well, if you, and they were doing video conference or doing conferencing, but it wasn't video. And so I said, so they don't see you. I said, so when you're in work hours, put a bra on, and when you're not, take the bra off. It's just something to signal that we're working now and then now we're not working. And, you know, just as simple as first, she lived alone. She didn't really care how she looked. She wasn't on video conferencing, but she needed something to say work time, not work time. She could still keep her pajamas on, but it was just like bra on, bra on, working, bra off, not working. (laughs) And that helped shift her mindset. You know, it's really about different things that um, signal to us it's time for this that is now done and we all need that and that's what we were doing before we went into quarantine shelter in place or before we had to start social distancing you know it was a freedom around it and now you have to have some structure so you can still have some freedom around different things i was just about to you 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 touched right on to the mindset of being focused being structured and that simple things like that you know, most people don't know that to, like you said, set a time schedule when you're working from home because we never had to really do it. Get dressed up or even, I mean, or get dressed, somewhat dressed or halfway, you know, present, you have to get into that. You're shifting your mind and say, I am now working. And that took for me to do as well to not just sitting around in sweats and be at the computer because I wasn't as productive because I would stop and watch TV. I would stop and you start doing my laundry. But I was like, no, I got to you know, get into the mindset that I'm actually at work and I, your work you've been doing is pretty much helping people to refocus. H- have you been super busy? I feel like being a life coach, being a, a creativity coach, that you would get a flood of calls. People like, help me, what do I do? Like even with teachers, that w- I was proud to hear that you you really helped the teachers out to really deal with now shifting to an online curriculum. That's a whole like, bomb that just blew up in teachers' faces of like throw your curriculum in the garbage you just start from week one and or like yeah. they put it on a digital shelf but probably ain't gonna use it. Yeah. I think the biggest thing that um in working with my educator clients and talking to my educator friends, you know, just not clients, is that the expectation for educators is that we can always pivot on a dime, which we typically do. But people think just just teaching face-to-face is exactly the same as online teaching. And it's not. I mean, people get degrees in online teaching. When you're a standard K-12 teacher, that's not the degree you had. You have a degree for teaching face-to-face. That's why you do practica experiences. That's why you do a semester-long student teaching experience in person. So one of the things I would say is, you know, if you hadn't had a newsletter prior to going into COVID and a lot of things were supposed to be online and stuff like that, you needed to have a news communication that went out to parents. And I didn't mean like some, I said, don't make something really beautiful. That's going to take you tons of time. Bullet points work well, because you know what? The parents you're sending this to are also tired and overwhelmed and they don't need a lot to read. But we need to continually be educating each other and rebuilding a different type of partnership. Because parents also were used to a certain type of partnership with their face-to-face teachers who were serving their kids. I said, so you just need to re- you know, reset the expectations, reset the partnership and what it looks like and just communicate that. And you know, I think the biggest thing for a lot of parents, and I will say this too, as a parent who is an educator, 
I appreciate when teachers are letting us know one, how they're feeling and two, what they're doing. Because then if you see some area where they are struggling, and when I say struggling, people think struggling is a bad word. Struggle is not a bad word. We can be struggling in different things. The bad thing is when we don't ask for the help for it. That's the bad part. The struggle is not the bad part. And I said, you know, if I see something and a teacher mentions something that they need support with or whatnot, in my son's school, my son is only going into eighth grade, but the, uh, what's, it, what's it called? The career college counselor of my son's school was, you know, mentioning something. And I was like, you know, I can help that person. I just sent them an email. I said, hey, I do this. I'm available if you need some help or relief just to help something like I already have this done. I'm already ready to go. I can support you in that. I think that's what we need to be doing at this time is really communicating and saying where we need the help and saying what we're doing in the meantime. I think people have this false sense of weakness when they express what they're not able to do. And I, I don't think that serves us at all. Should we, during COVID-19, how much time should we allow for ourselves of just doing absolutely nothing? Because I feel like, you know, where you're in shelter in place, people, you know, they, everyone defaulted to the whole Netflix and chill. Yeah. How much of the, should we take that time for ourselves with so much is happening, you know, with the civil unrest and COVID-19? Does that make sense in terms of how much should we actually just relax and, and understand that we are going through something? This is not, you know, normal. And then jump right back into the ebb and flow of work. Yeah, I think the biggest thing right now is that people don't have the vocabulary, the language for what's going on right now. And this is what's going on right now. We're all experiencing trauma, everybody. Even though you, you know, maybe the whole part of your life did not change, crumble, get disrupted in the same way as, you know, a neighbor's or coworker, a neighbor down the street, whatever, it's still trauma, trauma of pandemic. You know, there's death all around us in our countries, in our, you know, countries around the world, in our specific states and all of that. Hearing that news, seeing that news is trauma. The racial injustice, hearing that news, seeing footage, all this stuff, trauma. And I think the piece that people don't allow themselves to, to think about is that this is affecting me in some way I just don't know what it is. I mean, we just had our forever first lady say in her podcast that she was experiencing a low level of depression. Is that exactly what she said? Low level depression? Yeah, she did. And, yeah, listen. Yeah, and that's true. And that's, and like I said, we're not talking about that enough. We're not speaking about that enough. And I think the biggest thing that I am telling people around me, telling myself, telling my clients is, if you start feeling some type of way, you need to write that down and write what you're feeling then. Just write it down. It can be on a scrap of piece of paper. It can be on a post-it note. You can um, voice text it into your phone or mobile device, but capture that information so that when you are talking to a trusted friend, a spouse or partner, therapist, coach, whatever, you can read that to them and they can help you figure out what's going on because like I said we don't always have the vocabulary so when we have these moments when we can't focus when we just want to veg out or whatever that's in response to all that trauma those are real things that are happening to us that we keep ignoring because we're supposed to be adults we're supposed to be able to pivot we're supposed to be able to be productive we're supposed to be able to do things this is not regular adult life right now this is not regular childhood life none of this is regular so we can't expect to use previous coping skills in the same way. We're going to have to level up in our coping skills. What advice would you give to uh, parents right now who have children at home who are trying to deal with it all as well as, you know, being now at home, the educators themselves? Yeah, one thing I have been talking to fellow parents and clients about is really knowing when you can take a break. And not feel guilty about it because that's part because people take breaks but then they're feeling guilty the entire time that they're on break not helpful not useful doesn't take good care of yourself and so one of the things just speaking personally in my life my husband has not um stopped going to the office he's an essential worker so i have been home with the family the whole time he goes every day you know, sometimes it's five days a week. Sometimes he works the whole seven days, depending on what's going on because of essential work. 
And, you know, so that leaves me at home all the time, like in the walls and with the nurturing pieces. So, you know, we have had conversations around when I want to have a break and, you know, when I want to have a break, I don't want to talk to anybody. I might want to watch TV. I might not. I just might want to just read. But the point is I want uninterrupted time. I don't want to be interrupted in that. And so instead of arguing about it, like you're gone all the time, I don't get this time. When will we be able to schedule? Schedule. Elevate the importance. When will we be able to schedule time for me to have uninterrupted time? What will that look like? Because I'm going to need that, you know, in the next couple of days or next week. And we have to discuss it. I have to advocate for that and explain what's going on. And the conversation goes well. If I let it go too long, I'll, you know, come out. You're never here. I have to do everything. And it's just stressing me out. That's not going to help the conversation because then there's blame and then people are feeling bad because they're blamed and then defensiveness, defensiveness comes up. So we have to look ahead. We have to have these rituals for caring for ourselves so we can ask for what we need. So to the parents, figure out what you need. Sometimes it's just 10 minutes alone in the bathroom uninterrupted, you know, a break <laughs> in that routine. It doesn't have, you know, everybody, oh, I need a spa day, stuff like that. No, 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 no. I'm talking you got about. No I, spa. What spa are you going to? Everything is closed. They're closed. Yeah, I want to sit. I want, yes. I want to just sit on the porch with a dog and nobody else come out there. Like it can be that simple. So having those conversations. And then I also think about my parents who are single parents, right? You know, people are like, oh, parents. And, you know, we get all into our, um, you know, expected norm of the two parents. No, no. We have our parents out there who are single. And, you know, I have um, a couple of single parent friends that I'm like, well, maybe you can hook up with some other single parents and create your own safe pod so that you all can meet up for play dates. And so you are, you know, let's say you meet up with another parent, you know, you have the kids, that parent be outside in the park with the kids for 15 minutes. You just get to sit in the car and do whatever you want. And then you guys switch. So then that's 30 minutes of the kids playing, but each single parent got 15 minute breaks. Like be creative with what the time looks like. Keep the safety measure, but don't be afraid to ask for it, you know, to make it happen for yourself. And so that's the biggest thing I tell parents. And I said, and don't expect because you've been parenting X number of years, you're supposed to know what to do in a pandemic. That is in no parenting book. Absolutely. Right. Anyway. <laughs> Yeah. Um, you've given so many tips and I've, I've been jotting notes, looking at the questions. I, I, and what, what stood out to mo what stands out the most is schedule, schedule, schedule. I get asked for help right now. Your thoughts, level up your coping skills, but it seems like the best way, correct me if I'm wrong, to basically schedule, create a schedule for yourself to remain productive or to get that time for yourself or to do something beneficial. Yeah. But only in a weekly increments. Don't do that for the whole month because you don't know what the whole month's going to be like. Right. You no, know, maybe every Saturday or Sunday, if you want to do a week, you redo the schedule. And the parts that are working, keep that. But something might shift and be okay with that piece, but just have the routine of making a weekly schedule. That's going to fit how people are feeling and how people are doing. And also give yourself the grace to know that, you know what? I overscheduled this one particular week. Won't do that again. Doesn't make me less effective. Doesn't make me a failure. I just know better. It was a lesson. And move on. Did your teaching educator skills kick right in when you had to now help your eighth, eighth grader at home? That is like, oh, it came right back natural because you, like you say, you was a high school teacher for so long. You're like, I got this. This is so easy. Or did you also have like, oh my God, I have to now hope and be a teacher all over again no i mean i don't like to use myself in this example only because i think it's unfair <laughs> um, we you know I, only, I have an older child in college so you know they were still away um when they initially started they eventually came home after their semester so you know i really was only navigating one child it wasn't my first child and the other piece is that um his particular school is excellent in online learning just because it's a smaller school, it's a private school, so we are very blessed and privileged with that. So I didn't have to do like the schooling side, but I did have to work a lot more on the inner wellness, social emotional side, the loss of being able to hang with friends, um, being at home with your mom all the time. You know, mom's not as exciting as those friends. I get it, I'm not offended. 
and you know and just really renegotiating what that looked like and then putting together you know a fun schedule that helped him have some freedom of school at home so what did lunchtime look like you know negotiating how that felt and making him feel like he still has some choice when he was at home when he could be autonomous away from us and doing things so that was more of our side less of the academic side but more of the social emotional side but I think that was really good for me because it was a good test to see you know in my work with teens how creative I could be in my own home um one thing I will say to that and I know this is really more of a parent focused thing it's been a really difficult um negotiating the um organization of the home because there's a lot of projects that are all over the house that were not norm, not normally there because all that stuff would be happening at school so that was really adjustment for me because i like things kind of real neat and tidy mm -hmm. <laughs> and um we got a little COVID clutter going on so you know we're working on that and that's an adjustment but i haven't gone crazy yet <laughs> good um as we wrap up I want to ask one of the biggest things that's pressing is, of course, a lot of the civil unrest that's happened with the, you know, senseless killings of black men and black women, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery. How have you dealt with that with your clients or even organizations or institutions you've worked with? Mm -hmm. Well, one thing I would say just on, you know, a personal level as a black person, is like you know we can't consume that stuff all the time it will just crush our spirits so i had to when everything was at the you know you're already conscious of these things but now as things are being more televised and recorded it's all in our faces right and so i had to limit the amount of news i was consuming and where i was getting that news so that was the first step the second thing i was doing was you know we can't protest everywhere in the same way you know because of the safety of the pandemic right being in crowds and stuff like that and so i had to choose wisely the physical protests i was going to show up to but always in my life i've been a huge letter writer you know writing to congress people writing to managers in local stores writing to school systems like wherever i see some level of you know injustice or whatever always writing a letter like i have enough templates to just go around and so I just ramped that up in this regard. And on top of that, I invited some friends who, you know, I trust and all that. And I said, will you do letter writing with me? We can all do that. We um, don't have it formalized where you have to get together and meet, but sometimes people want to get together on Zoom or Google Meet and letter write together. And you know, each of us comes with five issues. And then, you know, you share the screen, right? And then we write the letters then. And the next person can pre present their next issues and we write the letters in and that feels really good because one is connection we feel very active we feel like we're very focused on things um and i think the biggest thing for me as an entrepreneur is talking about these things openly i mean you which i've known you for forever and you know i've never been unvocal about these things right so i don't I don't want it to sound like it's just so easy for everybody to talk about it because people have different jobs, they have different obligations, they have different comfort levels. But I've always been in the education sector and if I'm not advocating for people who are marginalized, I don't know what I'm doing in this work then. So that part is not been new, but teaching people how to do it in a way that, when I say protects them, you know, sometimes it's just not safe for people to be outwardly really advocating. That's real. Speak but, but here are some other ways that we can do it. And so speaking a lot about that, providing a lot of resources, and that's been great. Um, you have, you didn't ask this, but I want to put this out there. You know, we're in like 90 days out from, you know, the November election. And a lot of people don't know, but there are these postcard writing campaigns you can get involved in to, um, and I cannot remember the, the website, but I'll send it to you and then you can get it out to the community another time but you can write to them and then you write postcards to certain states about certain issues whether they have an upcoming primary wow. or something like that and so i have been doing a lot of that with friends um you know not in the same space but one person orders the list and then she distributes it and then we do the 
postcards and take them and we send them to wherever it is. Like we just did some a week and a half ago for this um, election in Florida mm -hmm. that was coming up, a primary that was coming up. We did one for New York primary earlier um, this calendar year. And, you know, we've been doing this since um, 2016. That is great. That is great community organizing. And I love the fact about you said, what you just said about sometimes protesting is not the safest, is not what people feel comfortable doing. And I'm one of those people who, even though I'm really out there in the community, I have my, um, you know, my own thoughts about doing protesting because I think it's ineffective for some, for me personally, if yeah. there is no policy piece uh, behind it. So I'm more likely when people often reference me as a community activist, I don't like that. I'm more so say community organizer because I'm organizing. I'm going to get an elected official's face. I'm going to find, as a journalist, I know how to get in that room and voice whatever. And I mean, I have friends who are non-color, um, non-black, and you, I know you as well. And I, I'm really proud to see them speaking out more and finding other ways to speak up and call out the injustices and those who have remained silent for so long and literally by writing literally by posting not just posting the black square on your social media page oh, no. i have some tough conversations with some non-black friends like i belong to this organization why haven't you said anything i'm about i'm questioning my non-essential relationships and them writing them speaking out them speaking in their their sphere their own specific demographic I'm like i don't need to hear this a non-black person needs to hear this. They need to hear you say it. So the writing campaign is amazing. Um, mm -hmm. You send me that look, I want to make sure it's going to be a part of this interview because that's another yeah. way to protest. That's another way to speak out. I think the hugest thing for me in being a quote unquote micro influencer, as an educator, people trust me because I am going to do my research and things like that. I'm not ever convincing people of people convincing people of things i'm inviting them to get involved i'm inviting you to leave a legacy i'm inviting you to care about other people i'm inviting you to make it safer for all of us that's the conversation where i try to really get people drawn in because they hear that better than racism like once they're in then we just go in and hit it hard i'm not trying to coddle people but i want to invite them to get involved i mean that's just my nature i want to invite you to really do something like oh what can i do everything's terrible i got five things for you to do do you have a pen do you have the internet do you have postcards do you have stamps do you have time let's go and you know that empowers people because that's the right amount of buy-in to start and then you see the ripple and then you keep going and i know for some other people that's not timely enough but you know we're all I'm, we're all gonna move it we're moving the needle in the direction it needs to go and you just have to be comfortable with that but you have to be dedicated with that round yeah. of applause for you that's why you are <laughs> one of my favorite educators author kanisha baynard productivity strategist and creative coach and bold thinkers before we go can we can you share a little bit about those great tools that you have that people need to know about to help them journal, to help them write, to help them use these workbooks. Can you give me a couple, uh, you know, seconds of those great tools and what what's the purpose and what they do? Sure. So my website is boldlivingtoday.com and that's by design. Um, you know, we should all be bold in ways that serve us. Believe in we can, owning our unique, um, in our unique qualities, listening and learning and untangling from things that keep us stuck and then deciding our time is now so those are the principles of bold um, living today and so everybody's invited to be bold in their way i am a curriculum designer you know it's the educator in me and as rashana mentioned i have you know my first book is called the self-love playbook for bold thinkers and really it's a self-study for yourself and how to love yourself better. And, and again, it's not about like spa days and things like that. It's about really digging deep into who you are and figuring out how to create a manifesto, how to really focus on your strengths and not always your weakness, and then develop areas that need more tending to. That's self-love, that's self-compassion. And then I have another book that's, specific on, that's specifically focused on productivity. It's called Focus on What Matters. It's a guided journal. I wrote that right after I appeared on the Dr. Oz show when I did a segment on using journaling for productivity. And it's an open, customizable guided journal 
for planning things around projects, for planning things around daily life, whatever you need the structure to be, the information is there, it's blank, you get to put in your own dates, you get to put in your own times, but it gives you a structure for focusing on what matters, for prioritization, for decreasing um, procrastination, and to really cutting out, cut out all the distractions, you know, starving your distractions. And then I have another book that's specifically for entrepreneurs, and it's more of a yearly guide. There's 52 areas that you focus on because, you know, it's 52 weeks in a year. You can start at any time in the year. You just start wherever you want. You don't have to go in order, um, which I always like because creatives like to do things their way. So I like to set things up that are just kind of like open, but structured, but open. You know, we need freedom in it. And um, that's called the... 52 Powerful Questions for Creative Entrepreneurs. And that's really designed to help um, entrepreneurs focus on what they do best because there's so much noise specifically out here in social media, people trying to sell you their five-step systems, become a millionaire instantly, you know, make a gazillion dollars in five days. No, this is about really looking at what you can bring to the world and get paid for it on your own terms. And for those of you who know, I did not plan to become an entrepreneur. I love teaching. I love being organizations, but we kept moving from my husband's job <laughs> and, you know, I needed to refocus my time and structure to support my family and keep working. So that's how entrepreneurship showed up for me. And you're doing a great job at it. Thank you so much for this interview. Thank you for sharing all these positivity tips. I look forward to talking to you soon.